welcome to Plato's Pod and the Quantum Feedback Group in a special episode recorded for both podcasts. I'm your host, James Myers, and I'll be bringing some ancient philosophy to bear on the latest technology with the question, what would Socrates say about ChatGPT? So introduced in November 2022, ChatGPT is a much debated technology. It's designed to interpret the prompts of users and assemble information from the internet to provide responses that appear as if they were written by a human. The technology uses predictions to associate inputs with outputs, and Socrates will have something to say about that. Inspired by philosopher Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, I'll bring Socrates to the offices of OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT, and introduce him to the company's CEO, Sam Altman. I'm interested to know what you listeners think. Do you share the concerns that Socrates will express? We'll continue to explore these and other issues in both podcasts. We're set to begin the fourth season of Plato's Pod with our continuing exploration of Plato's dialogues. We'll start by revisiting the Timaeus, which launched the podcast three years ago. And in the quantum feedback loop, we're looking forward to continuing discussions on subjects connecting philosophy, science, technology, and time. The quantum feedback loop is a production of the quantum record, which I began publishing in July 2022. I invite anyone who's interested to check it out at thequantumrecord.com. It's free, and you can subscribe for updates on the website, as well as many popular podcasting platforms. And now I'll take us into the realm of the imagination, and we might consider some age-old questions about the human relationship with our own technology. What would Socrates have to say about ChatGPT if he were to reappear 2,500 years after his time to witness the power of the technology today? No doubt he would have many questions, as he always did, and likely most of them would address the effect of ChatGPT on the human power of reasoning. Socrates always displayed concern for preserving the power of human reason, protecting it from sophists and others whose strong will and facade of knowledge could corrupt our ability to navigate life's unpredictable course. So if Socrates were to reappear now, I'm imagining a scene somewhat like the one that philosopher Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein invented for her immensely entertaining and enlightening Plato at the Googleplex. In her one-of-a-kind work of historical, philosophical, science fiction, Neuberger Goldstein brought Plato into the 21st century and gave him a rock star-like following, even though he's managed by a media handler who seems to have no clue what philosophy is. The conversation that ensues when Plato is taken on a tour of Google's headquarters, after he is told how search engines operate, is both hilarious and instructive. So we might put Socrates in a similar situation, perhaps taking him to the offices of OpenAI, the company that makes ChatGPT, and introducing him to its chief executive officer, Sam Altman. I picture Socrates entering Sam's doubtless well-appointed and comfortable meeting room and being offered a seat, with Sam taking a seat beside the philosopher. I think Sam would sit next to Socrates, partly in deference to the much older man, but also wanting to avoid conveying an oppositional stance, as he would if he were to sit across from Socrates. It being Sam's office, sitting across from Socrates would convey a tone of command that I'm fairly sure Sam would want to avoid. I say this because there seems to be at least a bit of philosophical motivation in Sam. After all, he's the one who established OpenAI as a purely not-for-profit company for the benefit of humanity. That's pretty philosophical, given the lure of so much money going around these days. I think there would be an affinity between Sam and Socrates, because philosophers of any degree tend to find interesting ideas to share freely among themselves. For technical assistance and to comply with corporate protocol, I'm pretty sure Sam would have advisors in the room with him, and I'm equally convinced Socrates would not. Sam's advisors would quite likely be less, not more, philosophical than Sam, and we'd be there to assist Sam in explaining the technological infrastructure in which ChatGPT operates. They would also be there, no doubt, to maintain a fully documented record of Sam's meeting with Socrates, although I'm uncertain whether their complete account would be shared on ChatGPT for broad public dissemination. After Sam, and when needed, Sam's assistants explained to Socrates the basis on which ChatGPT operates and the nature of its outputs, how would Socrates respond? What questions would he ask Sam? I'm nowhere near the genius of Plato on the character of Socrates, so I won't attempt to create a full dialogue between Sam and Socrates. I couldn't possibly do justice to it anyway. I have a suspicion, though, that Socrates might steer the questioning and path of his dialectic with Sam to a consideration of how we, as ChatGPT users, distinguish between good and evil. 
I think he would do so with good reason, likely to contribute a certain measure of clarity and perspective to the ongoing worldwide debate about the merits and problems of ChatGPT technology. Are we to judge ChatGPT as good? Are we to consider it bad? Or will we even be able to establish an understanding of its future potential for either of the two extremes? Socrates, of course, would not tell Sam Altman or any of us whether he thinks ChatGPT is good or bad or somewhere in between. That much I know about the character Socrates. It was the reason the Oracle of Delphi proclaimed Socrates to be the wisest man alive, for he knew one thing, which is that he knew nothing. All knowledge is recollection, and recollection is the account of the reasons why, as Socrates said in the Mino. As we all well know, recollection is always of some thing and never of no thing. In the Phaedo, Socrates asked whether the sight of one thing makes you think of another similar or dissimilar thing, and whether this must necessarily be recollection. He was implying that when we exercise recollection in the process of acquiring knowledge, we're always comparing one thing to another. I feel that Socrates would invoke our capacity for recollection, comparing good to bad before we pass our judgment on chat GPT. Now, since Socrates knows nothing, I think he would attempt to establish, with Sam or any of us, what the first principle of good is, what the first principle of bad is, and how they're related. I have no doubt he would then leave it to us to judge whether chat GPT is good or bad. Socrates would call it a process of dialectic, which humans can be particularly good at if they learn the skill and apply the effort to follow the path of a thing, like good or bad, to its first principle. So in his meeting with Sam, Socrates might well raise the proposition he made in the Republic that knowledge exists in a range that runs from less certain to more certain, on a line that is divided. He would likely do this, I think, upon learning that ChatGPT's purpose is to deliver knowledge to the user in response to a user's prompt. How does ChatGPT distinguish between belief, opinion, knowledge, and wisdom? Socrates might ask Sam, referring to the four divisions on the line of knowledge as they relate to the level of reliability the user would apply to ChatGPT's outputs. Sam might tell Socrates that ChatGPT's ultimate aim is to interpret and respond to prompts from 7.8 billion different perspectives, because that's the number of humans presently on Earth. Its purpose in doing this, he could say, is to make an abstraction of any user's question and then locate and compile related information from among trillions of data points on the internet. After hearing this, I have a sense that Socrates would be particularly concerned to question, first, the extent to which ChatGPT understands the human meaning of its inputs and outputs, and secondly, the means by which any misunderstandings can be corrected. Understanding can be a very tricky thing because each one of us 7.8 billion humans thinks at least just a little bit differently. Sometimes our different thinking leads to terrible conflicts, but sometimes it results in the most magnificent and imaginative of creations. If this is what Socrates would do, I feel strongly that his questioning would be based on his abiding concern for the preservation and flourishing of the soul. It is, after all, the soul that provides ChatGPT's input and relies on the technology's output. So Socrates lived and died, of course, before any modern religions were established. So if in his discussion with Sam, he were to refer to the soul, it wouldn't be in the sense of something that belongs to one faith or another. Recently, a very learned man told me he does not believe in the soul because he does not believe in religion. The word soul is, however, not exclusive to religion, and those who would prefer to avoid such associations might use the term animating force instead of the word soul. Words matter, as we know, and in any event, Socrates always took a broad view of the soul. For Socrates, the soul is invisible and therefore not accessible to the physical senses. Unlike the physical body, the soul is not destroyed by death, and during life it retains the capacity for reason to moderate between need and desire. So here are just a few lines about the soul that Socrates spoke in the Phaedo, just before his physical body was subjected to execution from the poison of hemlock. Look at it also this way, when the soul and the body are together, nature orders the one to be subject and to be ruled, and the other to rule and be master. Then again, which do you think is like the divine and which like the mortal? Do you not think that the nature of the divine is to rule and to lead, whereas it is that of the mortal to be ruled and be subject? The soul is most like the divine, deathless, intelligible, uniform, indissoluble, always the same as itself, whereas the body is most like that which is human, mortal, multiform, unintelligible, soluble, and never consistently the same. To Socrates, the soul's capacity for reason is not found in the bodily state of becoming. That's how Timaeus described our bodies and every other physical thing that comes to be and passes away in time. 
And that's how Socrates understood physical existence, which is similar to our modern understanding of physical entropy. We know that everything physical reaches its end in a state of maximum disorder. No, for Socrates, the soul's capacity for reason does not pass away in time, but is found in the eternal state of being. Unlike the physical state of becoming, the non-physical state of being always exists, never passes away, and is timeless. It's the reason why, in the Sophist, the visitor from Elia told Theotetus that that which is not is unthinkable. As Socrates stated in the Philebus, the capacity for reason is why the soul has a share of both the limited, which refers to the physical coming to be and passing away in time, and the unlimited, which refers to the non-physical state of being where reason is exercised. So with the information that it delivers, will ChatGPT help the soul to exercise reason? We might expect Socrates to ask this question. How would Sam respond, and would he understand the word reason in the sense that Socrates uses the word? For Socrates, reason is one of the soul's three parts, and it's the job of reason to find the balance between the soul's other two parts, which are need and desire. Today we use the word reason in many different ways, but for Socrates, this would be the first principle of the word. So being curious how ChatGPT would define reason, I asked the technology for the meaning of the word. Its output consisted of 299 words, none of which defined reason as the mediator of need or desire. ChatGPT produced what it referred to as eight primary meanings of the word, and I'm fairly sure that Socrates would object rather strongly to primary meaning number five, which reads as follows. Five, good sense or sound judgment. Using reason can mean making decisions or judgments based on good sense, logic, or rational thinking. It implies a lack of impulsiveness or emotional decision-making. So among other reasons, Socrates would take particular exception to this definition because it uses the word good, which is of course subjective in the individual judgments of 7.8 billion humans. I can only imagine how the word good would have been interpreted by a tyrant like Adolf Hitler in comparison to my own understanding of the word. That difference in meaning is so vast that no rational human could think the murderer who initiated a world war 84 years ago exercised reason, good sense, or logic. The word good for Socrates is a particularly important word. In fact, in the Republic, he stated that the universal form of the good, and he used a capital G here, meaning good in general and not just a particular good, quote, is that which gives truth to the things known and the power to know to the knower, unquote. For this and other reasons, I am certain that Socrates would not have endorsed ChatGPT's fifth primary meaning of reason. In fact, for Socrates, the pursuit of the good, together with the true and the beautiful, was necessary to pursue wisdom, which is the fourth and final division on the divided line of knowledge. Wondering if ChatGPT understands the importance of the true, the good, and the beautiful to Socrates, I asked it, quote, what did the true, the good, and the beautiful mean to Socrates, unquote. I found its 379-word response to be superficial, disappointing, and in any case, neither true, nor good, nor beautiful. ChatGPT provided no quotations of Socrates' use of any of the three words, and the two quotations it did provide were false. What's worse, the software provided no citations for the two false quotes, so the uninformed reader would be unable to verify their source. The first false quotation included in ChatGPT's response referred to what it called Socrates' quote, famous dictum, unquote, which it misquoted as, quote, I know that I am intelligent because I know that I know nothing, unquote. Socrates never said this, nor was it his dictum. Socrates continuously stated that he did not know anything, and most certainly he never stated that he had knowledge of his own intelligence. The words that ChatGPT put in Socrates' mouth were in fact from a statement by the Oracle of Delphi about Socrates, as reported not by Socrates, but by the character named Chariphon in the Apology, Plato's dialogue about the trial of Socrates. Furthermore, the second quotation the software attributed to Socrates about what it called his famous assertion that, quote, virtue is knowledge, unquote, is also false. Such words were never recorded as having been uttered by Socrates. In fact, in the Mino, Socrates disabused the idea that virtue is teachable, and on many occasions he asserted that, quote, all knowledge is recollection, unquote. So having reason to disbelieve ChatGPT's definition of the word reason, I am left to arrive at my own conclusions on the meaning of the word. I reflect on my own life experience and reasoning process. I cringe when I recall the many errors in my own reasoning, but I hope that they led me to learn and acquire knowledge to prevent repeated errors. So reflecting on my life fundamentally, I would have to agree with Socrates' view 
that I attempt to use reason to balance the right measure of need and desire, working together safely and responsibly to navigate my actions through space and time. Maybe it's the same way for you. Naturally, sometimes I become fooled or confused about what I need and don't need. I see some confusion in others too, chasing after things they think they need, but later discover to be harmful. Our economy tends to encourage consumption of things that aren't truly needed, particularly if they're profitable things. So I think Socrates would be somewhat concerned at the present defects in chat GPT technology, as Sam himself is, and has openly expressed. In fact, OpenAI's website warns against these defects. I imagine that Sam would explain the measures being taken to limit the impacts of the technology's defects and to protect its users. After all, Sam is a philosophical type. He feels it's important to warn users of imperfections in ChatGPT, and he did start OpenAI as a not-for-profit company, even if investors might now be entitled to practically all of the company's earnings. Being philosophical, I'm sure Sam would agree that it's not possible for any human to anticipate and prevent all possible errors. I imagine he would also even explain Heisenberg's uncertainty principle or Gödel's incompleteness theorems to Socrates, who I have no doubt would relate to them because they're implicit in his method of questioning. So if Sam were to demonstrate ChatGPT's capabilities with the same questions that I input, I think the defects in the technology's design would be plainly evident to Socrates. I'm unsure if Socrates would see these errors as relatively minor in the overall scheme of things, but I'm fairly sure he would be concerned about the extent of other similar and greater errors, because history demonstrates that errors can multiply, and exponentially so in combination. Will the soul that receives ChatGPT's outputs properly interpret where on the divided line of knowledge the output falls in terms of reliability? Will such output allow the soul to guide the body with reason, to strike the proper balance between need and desire? If the soul does a poor job in this function, maybe because it receives faulty information or is unable to prioritize between the information it receives, the soul might fail in protecting the body, which is one of the only two tools that the soul has at its disposal. If the body reaches its end sooner rather than later, the soul would have to start up all over again. I don't know about your soul, but my soul doesn't like that prospect at all because it makes all my efforts to become a better person seem futile. My soul, for one, prefers not to have to go back to the drawing board. The unexamined life is not worth living, Socrates might say to Sam, and then go on to ask, so how does ChatGPT help the soul to examine the life it has created, to know whether it is good or bad? I'm unsure how Sam would respond to the question, other than perhaps to declare the expected increase in information from developing, as his website says, quote, safe artificial general intelligence that benefits all of humanity, unquote. If our present economic system hadn't been explained to Socrates before his meeting with Sam, he might not know to ask OpenAI's CEO about the benefits that go to the company's investors and where they rank in priority with the benefits for all of humanity. All of this is the point to where I think Socrates would have a particular concern with the technology's effects on the soul, that is, in its use of language. ChatGPT is, after all, a large language model technology that generates a predictive output of words based on the prompts of users and previously recorded combinations of words. In looking back in time for previous word combinations, the technology is limited by the data on which it is trained, which could be many months out of date. Specifically, I imagine that what Socrates said about the origin of words in the Cratylus would shape his questions to Sam with a goal of protecting the soul and allowing for its flourishing. Seeing it the way of Socrates, the soul has two tools at its disposal. Call them the technology of the soul or the way the soul does things. So the techne of the soul is in its ability to cause the body to move and in its ability to connect with other souls through language. Imagine a soul incapable of language and therefore having no means of communication. It would be a defenseless soul, completely alone in what would most likely be a short life. So Socrates' abiding concern being the soul, which is plainly obvious in the Phaedo and Plato's other dialogues, he might have the most to say to Sam about language. It's only through language and the abstractions available in language that the soul can make a reasoned unity of so many physical perceptions. Socrates was fairly categorical about this task of the soul when he said in the Phaedrus, a human being must understand speech in terms of general forms, proceeding to bring many perceptions together into a reasoned unity. This is what I feel Socrates would imply, but probably not say outright, in his questioning as he attempts to gain knowledge of ChatGPT's capacity to preserve the soul's exclusive ability to make meaning of language. I expect this would be of prime importance to Socrates, that language being one half of the soul's arsenal of tools at its disposal, 
the soul must control the language. If the language were instead to control the soul, then the soul would lose one half of its power. Of course, the soul would retain its other powerful half, the body, but then what would be the point of the soul? Because it would not be the soul, but instead the language that controls the body. So imagine, if you will, a situation in which ChatGPT were far worse than it is, and its creators, unlike Sam, attempted to hide its defects. Imagine a technology that, unknown to us, but through either programmed intention or error, begins to subtly change our perception of words. It might begin to do so by mistaking the equivalence of two words, and then using one word in favor of the other. Such word changes can intensify human reactions. So I'll give you an example of what I'm saying, because I'm not sure what kind of linguistic example Socrates would conjure with current meaning comparable to his time 2,500 years ago. It's something I've been noticing much of in recent years. I'm unsure of the cause of the change, although like Socrates, I accept that everything comes to be from a cause. The change was rather abrupt and seemed to coincide with the rise of social media, another technology that could mutate profoundly as ChatGPT becomes more pervasive. I'm thinking of the word impact. In my earlier years, the word was used almost exclusively in the context of a collision. But over the past 20 or so years, has come to be applied practically all the time to any effect. The word impact, which had a specific and usually restricted meaning until about 20 years ago, has now effectively replaced the verb affect or the noun effect, words with a general meaning that we now rarely hear. I wonder why. Was it to intensify the effect of an affect that nearly every outcome is now called an impact? At the outset, I said I wasn't going to try to invent a full dialogue between Socrates and Sam because I can't imagine anyone other than Plato doing a proper job of that. But in order to present an analogy, I thought it best to put a few words in their mouths, understanding, of course, that they would have possibly limitless other ways of expressing similar things. So here, relatively briefly, is part of a conversation that might plausibly transpire between Socrates and Sam. I ask for Sam's forgiveness, in particular, if my choice of words are perceived as any form of dishonor, because my intention is exactly the opposite. I think we should celebrate Sam's ambition for OpenAI, that it benefit all of humanity, for its empowerment of the human soul, and because I can certainly imagine far worse goals. So here's my attempt at part of a dialogue, beginning with Sam. What do you mean, Socrates, when you speak about the soul controlling the transformer technology in ChatGPT? Do you mean one soul alone, like me, or anyone else here operating the circuits that connect the user's words to the words on the internet? It was never our intention that one alone should ever control us, and that's why we're still ultimately a not-for-profit enterprise, although admittedly now only partially so because of economic circumstances. There are obviously many souls with a hand in ChatGPT's transformer technology, and we have controls in place to ensure only the better souls, or people as we now say, share control of it. It's a very important responsibility, as I always say, and one that I do not shoulder lightly or alone. It is, together, our mission for humanity. I appreciate your question, Sam, for I was unclear on this point. I appreciate more so your conviction and mission for humanity. I know you forgive my being 2,500 years technologically out of date, because you so kindly said so as I entered this room. I will try to be a quick learner and not a burden. What I meant with reference to the soul is actually broader than any one human. Understanding your venture to be for the benefit of humanity, yours is plainly among the finer of souls for such responsibility, and of this I may have little doubt. My point is this, and it's to repeat something I said in the philibus. It's that the universe itself has a soul. And here, Socrates stopped for a moment as Sam restrained an urge to roll his eyes at such a broad and completely unprovable proposition. You see, Sam, Socrates continued, I don't know this for a fact. I'd like to think that I know the limitations of my knowledge, but I found no other probabilities to eliminate before I arrived at the conclusion. With no other probability remaining, it seems logical to establish it as a fact that the universe has a soul. I see where you're headed with your point about logic, Socrates. If it's not possible to establish what something is, it's sufficient to establish what it is not. That makes complete sense, certainly in the context of both Heisenberg and Gödel, whose work we discussed earlier. So I see your perspective is so similar to theirs, although from a very different angle. But does it go that far? I mean, does a soul exist to the entire extent of the universe, meaning everything? You know, setting aside my personal views, which are my own business, people are fighting bloody wars about this question now, some saying there's a god and others saying there's not. Is this what you mean when you say the universe has a soul? 
Believe me when I say that there are many who insist that God does not exist. I understand your concern, Sam, for the meaning of my words. I know I have much catching up to do in understanding the systems of belief that have developed over the past 2,500 years. They are indeed very different from those of my Athens. Anyway, in my day, many thought the gods, and I am not capitalizing the G when I refer to many gods, controlled their fates. Some thought there were ultimately three fates, or Moira as they called them, the first of whom created the flesh and bones from which our bodies are made, followed by the second who spun our bodies out, like cloth, over a certain extent in time, and then the last who cut the cloth of the body and released the soul. Those were the fates to summon my time. In any event, I think fundamentally what I am trying to say, the first principle, if you will, is this. Can we humans possibly have anything more than the universe itself has? Here, Socrates stopped again, seeing the deep consideration on Sam's face. Sam sensed that it was a question of relativity. Are you saying, Socrates, that if we humans have a soul, that the universe has to have at least as much as we do, if not more? And here Sam saw a smile take hold of Socrates' normally expressionless face. That is well said, Sam. In fact, you said it better than I, and in fewer words too. As I used to say, but in terms of today's idiom, which I first heard yesterday, less is more. I often rambled on about lesser and greater, but I think what I really meant is that we humans measure the effect of something, or as they now say, impact of something, based on quantity. If that's the case, then the closer we get to one, the less quantity and more unity we have, and the more we converge on a single quantity. When we are confronted by only one quantity to measure, our capacity for reason is surely greatest, is it not? Why, last week I read so many words written on the one in Plato's Parmenides, which was delivered to me by your chat GPT, together with so many commentaries for which I am grateful. It was so very helpful and reflects my intentions when I said that the soul must make a reasoned unity of so many physical perceptions. Although, as usual, I use far too many words. In any event, I will try to get to the point as I have gone on for too long. May I give you an analogy, if that would help to bridge any misunderstandings? I regret that my words and idioms are 2,500 years out of date. By all means, Socrates, please do provide the analogy. I read in The Statesman that analogy is often the most effective means of communication, and I have certainly seen the effect of analogy, or as we now say, impact of analogy, on thinking. Somehow the analogies you used 2,500 years ago are still very impactful. One of the reasons people still hold you in such high esteem is for your analogies. I'm honored by your words, Sam, and this honor I pass on to those whose words provide the analogies to me in the first place. So the analogy is this. It's based on my understanding that, from time to time, rocks from outer space enter Earth's atmosphere and cause devastating damage from their impacts on the ground. I was given a scientific briefing last week on the technology now in use to detect asteroids and defend all souls on Earth from their damage. A most commendable endeavor, if there ever was one, I must say. And so imagine that ChatGPT were to report to its users a conclusion that there existed a near certainty of an asteroid impact within the year. Some users might then prompt the technology to describe the expected impact, and ChatGPT would tell them it would not just be any impact, but of the kind that I spoke about in the Critias, the type that destroys an entire civilization. How would those ChatGPT users react to such news? I have little doubt that most would be very alarmed, Socrates. Some certainly would call into question ChatGPT's calculations and find reason to deny what others would see as a probability near to certainty as a probability could be. It could well cause great disagreement and strife of the type that the world witnessed a few years ago on another question of science. It could also cause global panic. I mean, that's entirely imaginable and quite possibly unleash a collective effort to perfect a technology that would deflect the rock's trajectory. I'm not sure whether you've been told, but we tested such a technology last year. The test was successful, at least in its very controlled circumstances, and after many years of planning. I'm sure no one knows, Socrates, whether we would be able to mount a successful defense of any asteroid event in so little time as a year. I do appreciate that risk, Sam, especially after what I learned yesterday. Do not fail to seek and to learn, I always said, and as the saying now goes, I like to practice what I preach. We said it quite differently back then. Different words for different times, I guess. In any event, my point is this, the technology's use of the word impact. Now, just imagine, however far-fetched it might seem, that a soul who had never known the difference between the word impact in its original meaning as a collision, and the word as it is now used, meaning any type of effect, and quite likely a very mundane one at that. 
Having received a report from ChatGPT of an impending asteroid impact, would that soul understand the consequences of those words properly if it fails to prompt the technology for more information? Would that soul know that immediate and urgent preparations for defense were warranted, possibly at all costs? Or would the poor soul assume that the event would be among the mundane types of consequences now usually called impacts? Possibly the doomed soul might think that the near certain impact is nothing more than a mere sighting as a rock passes by Earth at a safe distance. I'm quite serious in this questioning, Sam. We might think that a soul would apply sufficient reasoning to understand the meaning of words in a particular context. Yet I learned that only a few months before my reappearance, a lawyer used your chat GPT to write, on behalf of his client, a defense which contained several references to legal precedents which proved to be fictitious. Although a highly trained professional, the lawyer relied on its outputs and failed to heed your warnings about the technology's defects. Hallucinations, I believe, was the term you used. The yesterday, I was given to understand how unlikely it is that, at least in the context of an asteroid, a soul today would not know the difference between the word affect and the word impact. But I'm not thinking only about today's soul. My concern, as always, is for the soul for all time. And by time, Sam, I do mean all of it, as endlessly as past becomes future becomes past, with the present always in their midst as they circle about each other like a dog chasing after its tail. Timea said something very important about the nature of time. Time is of concern to the soul, but not to inanimate physical objects like space rocks, and so I believe it worth quoting the words of Timaeus here, with apologies in advance for going on at a bit of length about this. I consider his words on time to be near the better end of the divided line of knowledge, and I'm interested to know how you see them. My interest is driven, I hope you will understand, by my abiding mission to defend the soul so that it may flourish for all time. I guess I'm just trying to ensure that words don't get in the way of this most important mission. In any event, I'll stop my thoughts here and go on with those of Timaeus, noting that when he uses the words living thing in the first sentence, he has capitalized them to emphasize, as we earlier established, that the universe has a soul. So, here he's talking about the universe. Now it was the living thing's nature to be eternal, but it isn't possible to bestow eternity fully upon anything that is begotten. And so he began to think of making a moving image of eternity. At the same time as he brought order to the universe, he would make an eternal image, moving according to number of eternity remaining in unity. This number, of course, is what we now call time. For before the heavens came to be, there were no days or nights, no months or years, but now, at the same time as he framed the heavens, he devised their coming to be. These are all parts of time, and was and will be are forms of time that have come to be. Such notions we unthinkingly but incorrectly apply to everlasting being. For we say that it was and will be, but according to the true account, is is only appropriately said of it. Was and will be are properly said about the becoming that passes in time, for these two are motions. But that which is always changeless and motionless cannot become either older or younger in the course of time. It neither ever became so, nor is it now such that it has become so, nor will it ever be so in the future. And all in all, none of the characteristics that becoming is bestowed upon the things that are born about in the realm of perception are appropriate to it. These, rather, are forms of time that have come to be, time that imitates eternity and circles according to number. And what is more, we also say things like these, that what has come to be is what has come to be, that what is coming to be is what is coming to be, and also that what will come to be is what will come to be, and that what is not is what is not. None of these expressions of ours is accurate. So, Sam, those were the words of Timaeus. And after hearing these words, how is it that we can know, and I mean truly know and not merely have an opinion or even less a belief, what the words presented to us by ChatGPT really mean for all time. How will ChatGPT's words affect or impact the human sense of reason which operates in the timeless, non-physical realm of being? How will the words affect all souls, not just those that live today, but those not yet born, who will receive the teaching of their ancestors? What is the basis for the words at the time those words were formulated? And according to what meaning were the words ordered in the way that they have now come to be, with their priorities prevalent then and now? If we become reliant on the technology for our information, how will a soul in, say, 100 years from now, know that an asteroid impact necessarily means one thing only in the present context? That is, a cataclysmic collision with Earth, and not another, far less worrisome outcome.
Well, I'll leave the dialogue between Socrates and Sam at this, having gone on longer than I originally intended. But the point I think might come out as Sam and his assistants later discuss among themselves their understanding of Socrates' intended meaning in the context of their own language that is 2,500 years out of date with his. I imagine them doing this in a comfortable lounge, maybe with libations that cause relaxation and perhaps a slight loosening of the tongue, taking time to work through the many varied philosophical implications in a collaborative and pleasant way. It's the type of situation that might foster a thought-provoking exchange of ideas among philosophers, or so I imagine. Do you think he was referring to feedback loops, one assistant might ask, as they speak about Socrates' admonition that the soul should retain its power over language for all time? This question might prompt a further question from one of those present who might ask, by feedback loops, do you mean that language circuits established in the past might become sufficiently inflexible that they are incapable of change in the future? The assembled group would recall Socrates' words, having found them to be true, that language is one of only two technological tools that the soul possesses during life. The soul's loss of control over language, when language assumes control over the soul, would be devastating not only for the soul, but for the body that the soul defends and navigates through space and time. A soul dispossessed of its power over language, and therefore devoid of meaning and capacity to reason, would be a weak soul indeed, would it not? And who would wish such a state on his or her own soul? Certainly not I. Would you? Imagine the loneliness and pointlessness of such a soul. The body inhabited by such a powerless soul would be no better than a wooden marionette playing out actions on a stage in front of a rapt audience, the strings causing its actions being pulled by others for reasons only the others know. It's for these reasons that I think Socrates would steer his discussion on chat GPT to the importance of language and retaining the origins of the words, both input and output. How else would it be possible to decode and relay the information of the words correctly at a later date, and to judge whether they are good or bad, or somewhere in between? Maybe it's why in the Phaedrus, Thamus said to Thuth, the inventor of writing, that writing is a tool for forgetfulness if we don't know the origin of the words we hear or that appear on our screens. All knowledge is recollection, Socrates said, and when we hear or see the words impact or affect or effect, what is it that we recall of their varied meanings over time? And for how long will our recollection last in the future in a rapidly changing technological world? Were he to appear here now, 2,500 years after he last departed the earth, I have no doubt that Socrates would be greatly concerned for our souls. He was always concerned for the souls of others, even in the hours before the execution of his body. And so that's why I think that language would be central to Socrates' questioning of the soul's ability to conclude whether ChatGPT is good, bad, or somewhere in between. Socrates would encourage us to look for the first principles of the words good and bad, by which we judge not only ChatGPT, but more generally, our own actions and the actions of others. He would see it as the only way for the soul to know, at least as much as it is even possible to know, how best to defend the body and the soul's time in life from one moment in the present to the next. So Socrates would want us to avoid bad outcomes, and certainly the extreme of evil. Several times, Socrates alluded to the greatest evil, which is not what you might think. For Socrates, the greatest evil is somewhat similar to becoming a prisoner of a feedback loop, perhaps of the type that one of Sam's assistants imagined after meeting with Socrates. We might consider the prisoner in the cave in the Republic to have been caught in a feedback loop, in the sense that he was unable to know the inputs that caused the outputs of his actions. The inputs, in the prisoner's case, being the shadows cast on the wall by the unseen men on the parapet. In the Phaedo, Socrates said that the philosopher reflects that violent pleasure or pain or passion does not merely cause such evils as one might expect, such as one suffers when one has been sick or extravagant through desire, but the greatest and most extreme evil, though one does not reflect on this. As we think about Socrates' words, does it seem reasonable to imagine that a soul trapped in a feedback loop would be incapable of reflection? Socrates elaborated on the danger of the soul becoming trapped in a repeating image of its own making in the Theotetus when he told the geometer Theodorus, My friend, there are two patterns set up in reality. One is divine and supremely happy. The other has nothing of God in it and is the pattern of the deepest unhappiness. This truth the evildoer does not see. Blinded by folly and utter lack of understanding, he fails to perceive that the effect of his unjust practices is to make him grow more and more like the one and less like the other. For this he pays the penalty of living the life that corresponds to the pattern he is coming to resemble. And if we tell him that, unless he is delivered of this ability of his, 
when he dies, the place that is pure of all evil will not receive him, that he will forever go on living in this world, a life after his own likeness, a man tied to bad company. In both cases, Socrates referred to reflection or likeness. It's as if the greatest evil is not being able to see oneself, and therefore not to know thyself, but instead act as a marionette does in a stage, with its strings being pulled by others. That's what it's like to be a bad man tied to bad company, to be robbed of one's capacity for reason and trapped in an image constructed by others. How would it be possible, in such imprisonment, to live and examine life? Examination would yield only the established patterns of the past and preclude imagination for the potential of the future. All of this, I imagine, is what Socrates would have to say about ChatGPT if he were to reappear now, 2,500 years after his time, when the meaning of language motivated human behavior as it still does today. And I think, well, actually, I'm sure that Socrates would leave it to Sam and to us to conclude whether ChatGPT is good, bad, or somewhere in between. <laughs>